Hi, I'm Pam, and today I'm ranking some video games. So a little while ago, I made a video ranking all of the NES games that I've reviewed on my channel, and people seem to really like that format, so I decided to do more of them. I put up a poll on my Patreon with a bunch of different categories that I could rank games in, and the winner, by a small margin, was CRPGs, other known, otherwise known as computer role-playing games. Now, you might be asking, what exactly is a computer role-playing game, and I don't have an exact definition. Um, it really depends on the game. It's one of those things where there's a bunch of traits that they have, um, but you know, no one has all of them. You know, it just sorta, I know it when I see it. So some of the things they have in common though, um, a lot of them are isometric, though not all of them. Um, some of them existed before isometric views were a thing. They often have a tactical bent to their combat. There's usually some kind of stat sheet. Um, the main thing, it's usually based around creating and or building a character or a party of characters to take through adventures and making decisions both in how to mechanically level them up and how to narratively interact with the story and the characters you meet. Last night, I actually went through the CRPG book, which is a beautiful book by uh, Bitmap Books, and just looking for if there was any games that I had played that I might not have categorized as CRPGs. And it involved me adding some, but not others. And I can't exactly tell you why. Like, Dragon Age Origins, I'm like, okay, I'm comfortable classifying that as a CRPG, even though I first played it on Xbox. But for some reason, Mass Effect? No, I wouldn't put that in the CRPG category. So you may disagree with which games I've put in this category or some that I've left out, but uh, it's my list. So I've come up with a list of 39 computer role-playing games that I've played that I'm going to rank today, and let's get started. Okay, so we've got our tier list here. I'm using the website Tier Maker to uh, make this. I just had to input all my own images and uh, just make the tiers. Again, just to go over what the rankings mean, S tier is like, you know, god level CRPG, one of the best in the genre. A is a very fantastic game. B is a good game. C I would put as like mediocre, as many good things as bad. D is a bad game and F just has absolutely no redeeming qualities at all. And I have to say, based on this list, I don't think anyone's gonna be going in F, but we will see. And I guess we'll start by going through alphabetically, which means that the first game is Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura. This is a game by Troika Entertainment, or Troika Games, who also made Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. And this game has a lot going for it. It has some of the most interesting world building and some of the most interesting character building of any CRPG I've ever played. The stat sheet is just so interesting to dig into. You've got um, a, a choice between going down a magic path or a technology path and going too far down one will sort of block you out of the other as they don't really get along too well. You've got your regular characteristics like stamina and strength and things like that. There's a lot of really great dialogue and multiple ways to go through um, each of the quests, really good companions to get. Now the bad thing about this game is that, um, as is common for Troika, it was pretty buggy and rushed at the end. The quality sort of falls down um, near the end of the game, and honestly, the combat isn't very good. This is probably one of my least favorite combat systems and the thing that's prevented me from playing it again in the last few years, even though I really do want to play it again. So because of all of this, I'm still going to put Arcanum in the A tier. The bad combat is not enough for me to like drop it down because the story and the characters and just like the whole world building and character building is just so good. So now we've got Baldur's Gate. And Baldur's Gate is really, along with another game we'll get to soon, one of the games that sort of reinvigorated the computer role-playing game. 
Uh, it's based on D&D, so it was quite popular when it came out. You play a character who is sort of off on a very personal quest to find out and ends up finding out who they are and where they came from. You've got some really great companions in it. Overall, I think Baldur's Gate is a very good game. Um, the thing is, and this will happen in a few games, where the first one comes out and it's really good, but then the second one comes out and it kind of um, overshadows the first just because of, you know, uh, little refinements and improvements in the playability that were made. So Baldur's Gate is a good one. I like it. I might get some flack for this, but I'm gonna put Baldur's Gate in B. It just got overshadowed so much by the second one I found. Um, if I was gonna play one, it would be uh, two Shadows of Om. So we'll get right into that one. And this one, it takes the story that started in the first one and continues it on. You've got a bunch of the same characters and you get to learn more about them. And I find that the interactions are more interesting and impactful than they were in the first game. The fights are also more interesting than they were. So I'm gonna put Baldur's Gate 2 in the A tier. Now another one of the series that really had a big impact on computer role-playing games is Diablo. And I've played very, very little of Diablo 1 or 2, so I'm not ranking them here. Um, so I'm just ranking Diablo 3, which is not my kind of game, really. Uh, the influence that Diablo had is one that I don't like, and you're gonna see that when I rate games that are sort of Diablo clones later on. But Diablo, for me, seems so much like it's about loot more than characters or story or world building. Like, the overall story is all right, the characters are fine, but it, it's a loot game. You're supposed to just keep playing it. You play it once, you beat Diablo, you go back on a harder difficulty just to see how much more powerful you can make your character, which just isn't, isn't that interesting for me. So when I originally played it, I got to the end, I beat Diablo, and I was like, okay, game over, I'm done. So Diablo, like, it's a nice and polished game, and I'm sure people are still playing it now, but for me, it's just not the kind of CRPG that I like. So I'm putting it in C. Also, I remember when it first came out, because I did get it on day one, and remembering not being able to connect to the servers until like 3 o'clock in the morning, that awful auction house that they put out uh, when it first came out. So yeah, I'm comfortable with Diablo and C. So now we have Disco Elysium, which I think is the newest game on this list, and quickly became a classic of the genre. It was my game of the year in, not last year, the year before when it came out. Uh, just everything about this is so good. It takes a concept which can be overdone, the sort of amnesiac character, but it means that you can really build your character to be what you want. And there's so many interesting um, stats and abilities and things that you can get. Uh, it's not just you know, your basic, like, charisma, intelligence, agility stuff that you usually get, and it's also a game that's very much based on text. There is fighting in the game, but there's not really a combat system. You're just making the decision and basically rolling to see what the outcome is. And a lot of the time, failure is actually the more amusing outcome, which also brings up the fact that this game is hilarious and just has some of the best writing and dialogue that I've seen in a game. Disco Elysium is going to be our first S tier. It very quickly established itself as one of the one of the best of the genre. Okay, so next up is Divine Divinity, and this is the same series that the Divinity Original Sin games came from. Unfortunately, this is one of those games I was referring to that's basically like a Diablo inspired game. It's an action RPG that has a lot of focus on just the number of items that you can find in the game, whether that be equipment or things that you can like craft and make potions and things with. This isn't one that managed to hold my attention. I only played a few hours before I retired it and this was back, back closer to when it first came out. And just looking back at it now, it's kind of on the ugly side. Even for two, the early 2000s, it's just all very 
brown looking. Um, nothing is that interesting to look at. And though there are more focus on character and the overall story than the Diablo games, I, I just didn't really like it. So I'm going to put this one in D. Now, the Divinity series was revived back in 2014 with Divinity Original Sin, and this was a very interesting one, though also quite flawed. And the problem with this game is that it was built to be a co-op game, which isn't a problem in itself. Um, honestly, this isn't the kind of game I would want to play co-op, but I know that other people have enjoyed it. The problem is that if you're playing solo, that you still have this sort of co-op shadow in the background. Like, when you want to make a decision, you, you kind of have to, like, fight with yourself and do this rock-paper-scissors thing based on what your character wants to do and based on what your other character wants to do. And I just found that quite annoying. Um, there was definitely some good stuff in here. Like, I really liked the writing and the story. Um, this is another one. It's, it's sort of gone down a peg just because of how much better the sequel is. But yeah, because of the issues, especially around the co-op um, thing about Divinity Original Sin, uh, I'm gonna put this in C? I feel kind of bad about that, but I feel like it, it had a number of problems, and even though I played through the whole thing, and I did quite enjoy it when I first played it, um, the second one is just so much better and fixes so many of those problems. So we will talk about that one now. Divinity Original Sin 2. Uh, fantastic. One of the best modern computer role-playing games. It's got this huge epic fantasy story. You have a number of different characters to choose from when you're playing through the game, or you can create your own, but each of them has their own backstory that you learn about. And what's really cool is that you pick from whatever, like the seven or eight characters there are to play as, but then the other characters appear as NPCs, so you sort of get to know all of them, and then if you want to play as another one the next time around, you can do that. So the characters are some of my favorite. The first time I played it, I was a skeleton who could steal people's faces and disguise himself as them, and it was just really interesting. The combat is super tactical. There's so much stuff with like using the environment to your advantage, whether that's having your enemies stand in water and casting lightning spells, or like um, burning oil that's on the ground, things like that, but you also have to be really careful about where you're standing. Just excellent story and characters and combat, and I'm gonna put this one as... Mm, I'm gonna put this in S tier with, uh, with Disco Elysium. Everything's good. Story, characters, mechanics, your role-playing ability, uh, and the combat. So yeah, S tier. Feeling like this video is going to be very long. But now we're on to Dragon Age Origins, and though I did play this on Xbox, and I really consider it a console role-playing game, it does have that CRPG feel, especially with the tactics and the combat, which, which the series sort of loses later on, which is why this is the only one that I'm going to be ranking from the series. But Dragon Age Origins is a really fun game. I love that there's the different origin stories that will impact uh, your not just your introduction, but how people re will react to you further on in the game. It's got some really good characters that you sort of come to love, and an interesting story about the Darkspawn. And I really like the Grey Wardens. They're sort of one of my favorite groups. Um, factions, whatever you want to call them, in any role-playing game, because they're not really these big heroes, even though they're like so self-sacrificing in like what their purpose is and what they have to do. So I'm gonna put Dragon Age Origins as an A. Um, the role-playing is good, and yeah, it's got that Bioware cozy feel with the excellent um, companions to learn about. Alright, so now we have a whole bunch of Fallout games, and the first Fallout, which came out I think a year before Baldur's Gate, it really helped revitalize the CRPG, CRPG genre. 
Um, it was sort of at a time where because of like Doom and Wolfenstein, games were really getting more into like the first person shooters and things like that. And the really like story and character heavy games were taking a back seat. So Fallout sort of showed what a role playing game could be, even though it didn't do nearly as well as Baldur's Gate, I think just because it didn't have that D&D um, IP tied to it. But Fallout's a very good game. It's honestly pretty clunky to play now, just in terms of the combat and the interface and everything. But the writing is stellar, the quests are really good, and the number of options you have for how you respond to each scenario is great and was sort of groundbreaking at the time it was released, I think. So I'm gonna put Fallout... You know what? I think it might have to go with Baldur's Gate. Again, just because the second one improved on quite a number of things. Um, just the interface and the combat is a little bit more fun, and it's got some really good side characters and things. I actually really want to replay the Fallout games, because it's been a number of years since I played them. But Fallout 2 is going to go in A tier, just because of the improvements it had over the first game. So after Fallout 2, a number of years after Fallout 2, the series was revived, except it was made as a first slash third person game rather than that classic isometric perspective, but using the same sort of world as um, the original games. And even these, whether they're CRPGs is like, eh, they're just on the edge for me here, but Fallout 3, I was so excited that the series was being revived, so I think when I first played it, I gave it a little more slack than I do now. Um, now I find it a little awkward to play, I don't particularly like the combat other than bats. It does have some interesting things in it, particularly when you're finding other vaults, but uh, the role playing isn't fantastic, the game's just kind of janky. I'm gonna put Fallout 3 in the C category. Now Fallout New Vegas, it has all the same problems. Like it's still very janky, but the writing and the world building is a bit better. So I'm gonna put New Vegas in the B category. And then Fallout 4 is pretty bad, honestly. It sort of takes anything that was good about the first two and strips it out and just does a whole bunch of random like base attacks and base building and characters that you don't really care about. So I'm putting Fallout 4 in D. Alright, so now we are on to Icewind Dale. And I played this after I'd already played Baldur's Gate and um, Planescape Torment, which was made by Black Isle, the same studio that made this. And I think just because those games were so strong. When I put on Icewind Dale, I was just completely underwhelmed. I don't know that there's anything specifically wrong with it, just like the characters in the story just didn't catch me like the other games did. So I'm gonna put Icewind Dale as a C because it just, um, I, I never ended up finishing it, obviously, but it just, after like the heights of those games that I had played before, this one just didn't really seem to have anything that interesting to offer. So now we're on to Knights of the Old Republic, another couple which are just like right on the edge of whether I would consider them computer role-playing games or not, and though they were originally Xbox games. Um, they are on PC, and they do have a lot of what I would consider um, the makings of a CRPG. So, starting out with Knights of the Old Republic, I think this was a fantastic way to bring the Star Wars universe to life without having to focus on like the Skywalkers and all the things that um, some people who make Star Wars properties seem to think are the most interesting part of it. So, uh, this was a really good game, had a lot of really good characters, especially to get to know and I really liked the combat system. It was a bit of a different kind of system. Um, the light and the dark, you know, a little binary, a little not the most interesting morality system, to be honest, but that's, you know, I mean, you work with what you have. 
But uh, KOTOR was a really good game. I'm going to put this in... Is it an A? I think I'm going to put in B. Yeah, as, as a, specifically as a computer role-playing game, I'm going to put it in B. Now, Knights of the Old Republic 2, better in many ways, but also worse in a few. Worse in that the game wasn't completely finished, the end was definitely rushed, but better in like some of the characters and stories in this one in particular. So I'm going to put this one in B as well. So now moving into a slightly different part of the genre, the more dungeon crawling. Uh, Lands of Lore, The Throne of Chaos was one of my favorite games that I played the most on PC, um, sort of in my early teen years, I think. And it takes previous games like Eye of the Beholder and Wizardry and Ultima and things like that and sort of streamlines it. So the uh, character building and the leveling up and things is very is on the simpler side like there aren't that many classes to choose from in fact you're just choosing from four different characters to play as each with their own strengths and weaknesses but in terms of just the dungeon crawling and the combat and the items and things you get it's just a lot of fun the story is interesting and is well voiced by some famous people and I just think it's one of the most fun dungeon crawling kind of games. So I'm gonna put Lands of Lore as an A. And then following in that lineage are the Legend of Grimrock games, which are pretty similar to Lands of Lore, honestly. It's a sort of 3D dungeon crawler where you're going through and you can cast spells, you can use weapons. They're quite puzzle heavy in terms of getting through each of the individual dungeons. Legend of Grimrock 1 was a lot of fun. I finished that one. Uh, the dungeons were challenging, but fair for the most part. Um, and then Legend of Grimrock 2 really, really expanded things and made the world so much bigger. And I actually didn't end up finishing it just because any time I put it down, I would sort of forget where I was and what dungeons still had things to do. So I didn't particularly like that it got a little too big for my liking, so I'm gonna put Legend of Grimrock 1 in B, because it's a really good game. I don't think it's as good as like Lands of Lore, maybe it's just because it's not classic. And then Grimrock 2 is going to go in C. I feel like C is too, too low, because it's a good game, but not good enough to make me finish it, so I guess that's fair. Next up, we've got Masquerada of Songs and Shadows. I can't, I can't read the text of this. So I think it's of Songs and Shadows. And this is a strange game. It's got all the hallmarks of a CRPG. It's got isometric perspective. You've got um, your main character and a party of characters that you need to be worried about. It's got that turn-based tactical combat. But what it misses is the actual role playing. Like, I think there's a little bit of like talent choosing, but other than that, like, you're not making any decisions. The narrative is basically a straight line that you're just running from one point to the next point with some combat in between. It's very, very text heavy, which I don't have a problem with. Like, Disco Elysium is almost all text, but it's text in service of the role playing and making decisions and doing something with all the information you're presented. Whereas Masquerada is just a whole bunch of world building that you don't really interact with in any way. So as a role playing game, I'm gonna put this one as a D. All right, so here's another one that was sort of impacted by the games that I had played in the era and was comparing it to Neverwinter Nights. I think this is another advanced D&D um, based game. And this one just, I remember putting it on and it seemed like it was almost entirely about combat and there was very little role playing involved. Like you were building up your character mechanically, but in terms of like who your character was and who they were interacting with, 
There wasn't that many decisions to be made, the story wasn't that interesting, it just seemed like a whole bunch of dungeons and fighting, which was just not at all what I'm looking for in this kind of game. So I'm putting this one in D as well. So now we've got Operencia, The Stolen Sun, and this one did make a, an appearance on one of my top 10 of the year lists. This was a really good one. This is in the same vein as like a Lands of Lore or a Legend of Grimrock, except it has a lot more focus on the character. You really get to notice, um, to get to know your companions very well. They've all got stories that you get to discover. And as you're doing this 3D dungeon crawling and fighting and puzzle solving, there's also just a very interesting story to move you along. The combat's very interesting. It's a turn-based combat um, with a field that includes like different positions. So you can attack different positions based on like where you are and where your enemies are. And the abilities are all very cool. They've got really excellent spell effects. And yeah, I, when I was wanting this kind of game, this one just really, really hit the spot. So I'm gonna put this one in A. So the next game is one that I've turned a little on. Pillars of Eternity was sort of the first of the most recent CRPG renaissance. Um, it was a genre that I really missed. So when this came out, I was so happy just to have something like this to play again. I think this actually ended up as my game of the year in whatever year this was, 2014, 15, I don't remember. Um, but now that I've played more, just since so many more have come out since then, and it even had a sequel which was a quite a bit better, um, I've sort of re-examined it. And it's still decent. I like, generally, it looks really good, it plays well. I like that it's got these little segments where it's like, it's basically the dice rolling thing and it'll turn into just like a drawing on a page that takes you over like what you're doing. Like you're trying to climb a cliff or you're jumping into a raging river and you get the options of how to, what thing you would do. Um, sort of like if you were playing a tabletop game or something like that. And it's good, but you know, it's just a little clunky in some ways. It was a Kickstarter game, so they put a bunch of um, content from the backers into the game. There were just NPCs all over the place just spouting things that were written by backers, which weren't all that interesting and didn't add anything to the game. So I'm gonna put Pillars of Eternity as a C, which seems low, but it's just, again, C isn't a bad game. C is just a, an okay game. So Pillars of Eternity Deadfire, the sequel, improved things quite a bit. It had a more interesting story, more interesting characters. One of the best things is that you were basically a pirate and you had a boat and you sailed the seas between the islands visiting all the different places and all the different factions. And it was just generally much more interesting of a game. So I'm gonna put this one in B. Now we've got Planescape Torment, and can you guess where I'm gonna place this? Torment has one of the most interesting worlds in any CRPG. It's based on the Planescape setting, which, you know, isn't nearly as popular as something like D&D, but it's just so much more interesting, and they wrote it in a way where every little thing in the game, whether it was a place or just a little trinket that you pick up or a piece of equipment had this backstory behind it that was just so, so interesting. All of your characters are just great to get to know. There's some of my favorite things are like the brothel of slaking intellectual lust, which is just a mastercraft in uh, RPG writing and just the ways that you can play the nameless one whether you want to be intelligent and like gather all your memories from before or whether you want to be more of a brute. It's just really, really good. It's just some of the best writing in video games. And though the combat, here's the thing about the combat. A lot of people don't like the combat in this at all. I find it inoffensive. I don't think it's great combat, but it also doesn't take away from the game for me. So um, just with that note, it's still a nest here. 
So next up is Sacred, and this is another one of the action RPGs, definitely influenced by the early Diablo games. And the most interesting thing about this is the different classes that you could play. Um, it wasn't, you know, just your normal things. You could play like a Vampirus or a Seraphim, which was very interesting. I'm pretty sure this is one where you're riding around on a horse a lot of the time, which was cool. But generally, it was a game that was all about the combat and the loot, and the combat was actually fairly difficult. It just didn't have the story or character building that I want out of a role-playing game, so Sacred is going in D. So next up are the Shadowrun games, and these are based on the Shadowrun tabletop role-playing game. And I have to say, it's nice to get a CRPG that's not in the fantasy setting. So many of them are fantasy games, and this is more of that, like, cyberpunk, futuristic thing. You're going up against corporations, you've got characters, I think they're called Deckers? Who can, like, jack into the Matrix and, like, go and do things in, like, this whole other world that you can see. Um, a, th a lot of the stories are about taking down corporations, working for these, like, shady entities. Uh, there's a lot of, like, betrayal and twists and turns and things like that. So the original Shadowrun Returns was pretty good. Um, I, again, I feel like this is one where every um, successive game got a little bit better. The first one was a solid game, but not, um, you know, nothing terribly interesting about it other than the setting. The RPG-ness of it maybe seems a little bit outdated by this point, but it's a solid game. So I'm gonna put this in C. Now, Shadowrun Dragonfall, which is apparently an expansion, although it is a standalone game, basically takes the setting from the first one and just expands on it, makes a much more interesting story. It's also a lot longer of a game, I would even argue maybe running a little bit too long for its own good, but it's got more interesting characters and a more interesting story. So I'm gonna put this one in B. And then Shadowrun Hong Kong, I think is the best of the series so far. All of the characters are really, really interesting, and I loved hearing about their backstories. And the setting was just a more interesting and more attractive setting than the rest of them had been. So, Shadowrun Hong Kong... I'm gonna put this in... Is it an A or is it a B? Mm, it's hard to say. I'm gonna put it in... B. I would put it higher than Dragonfall, but not quite up to the A category, but still a very, very solid CRPG. So next are Sunless Sea and Sunless Skies, which are a little bit different mechanically than most of the games I've talked about so far. They're based on the Forgotten London world, which I think is a, like a text-based adventure, and in both of these, you are the captain of either a ship sailing the sea or a train going through space and they're very interesting it's got like kind of lovecraftian vibes where like there's things out there that are beyond comprehension one of the things you have to manage as you're going is madness like your crew can go mad based on these strange sights that you're seeing as you're exploring the world it's a really fun place to explore even though especially in the first one it can be a little slow moving but you're basically going from port to port picking up quests picking up items um, increasing the power and the speed of your ship um, bringing new people on board trying to raise money and they're just very intriguing stories i'm gonna put sunless sea in the b ring I'm gonna put Sunless Sea in the C rank. Again, fantastic stories. In terms of the actual gameplay though, it's just very slow. There's some interface problems that it has where Sunless Skies really um, helps out. 
like in terms of like the journaling and be able, being able to keep track of what you're actually doing, which was definitely something that the first game made me struggle with. So Sunless Skies is going to go in B. Also, I just have to say I am judging these specifically as role-playing games. Like as a more of a visual novel adventure, like just in terms of like the writing quality, these would probably score a bit higher, but in terms of role-playing, just a little bit lower. So next up, and I guess I titled this The Witcher rather than just Witcher, but the first Witcher game is a computer role-playing game. Every time I bring up that this is an isometric game, someone argues with me saying it wasn't an isometric game. But there was two camera modes. One was isometric, which was the superior one, and one was over the shoulder, making it more of an action game. But it was 100% had an isometric view that you could play the whole game as. So The Witcher 1 is a little dated now, but honestly, it's also my favorite of the Witcher series. As they go on, I think they sort of fall out of the CRPG genre, but it really takes the book material and adapts it in a very interesting way. The quests and the characters and everything are very good. And though Geralt kind of has his own personality, um, like you're, you know, he's Geralt no matter what, but there's still enough role playing in terms of like, the mechanical role playing and how you react to each quest and each character that you come across that's very interesting. It does have some weird things in it, like the sex cards you get every time you sleep with a lady. Um, you sleep with a lot of ladies in this game. But it's a really just interesting world. I don't love the combat, but I like it more than in the later games. And I'm gonna put The Witcher as a B. So Torment Tides of Numenara is a sort of spiritual successor to Planescape Torment. I don't think they got the rights to the Planescape universe, so it's sort of in a different world, I guess? But it has the same kind of interesting world building and things that you just want to learn more about as you're going through. Some of the characters are very interesting. Um, I thought it was a decent successor, though not entirely um, successful. Some of the main problems with this game are that it's a, a turn-based combat system, which is actually what I prefer, but so many of the fights have you fighting so many enemies that it takes forever for a turn to go by. Like if they had less enemies that were just stronger, it would have just sped things up. But as it was, so many of the encounters just took what felt like years to get through and get back to your turn in order to play. Uh, yeah, so this is, I re again, I do really like the world building and the storytelling in this game, um, but it is just a little bit on the slow side. So I'm gonna put this in B. And I just want to say again that B and even C aren't bad ranks. Like, it's not just S and A that are the great games. A bunch of things in B are on my list of my top 100 games of all time. So I think I'm just a tough, a tough scorer, but okay, we'll go on with it. So Tyranny is a game I was very excited about. It's one that uh, touted that you got to be the bad guy. Um, so rather than trying to save the world or even be like the puckish rogue, uh, you, you were the evil one and you can make decisions around that. So in the actual game, you work for the bad guy who's basically conquered the world and you're going around and trying to just like, you know, firm up that rule and make everyone sort of come to heal. And I just didn't find it very interesting at all. Uh, it, the whole your evil thing didn't really work for me. The choices were still the same, um, kind of binary, you can kill the puppy or you can pet the puppy kind of decisions. So I don't, maybe I'm just not meant to be evil people in role playing games, but most of the bad choices just weren't appealing. And I feel like they should have been, especially since you're supposed to be the bad guy. So. I didn't end up finishing Tyranny, it just, 
the story, the characters, nothing really appealed to me all that much. So I'm going to put this in D. So now we come to Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which if you follow this channel at all, you know is one of my favorite games of all time. Talked about it a little bit. Um, it just... Until Disco Elysium came out, I thought this was the epitome of computer role-playing games, just in terms of creating your character, the way you interact with other people that you're meeting, the way you respond to quests, being able to be like stealthy or a hacker or do lock picking or just kill everything, being able to use vampire powers but having to hide them from the public lest you get in trouble with the masquerade. Just fantastic game with fantastic writing. Some of my favorite side quests of all time, sort of one of the best survival horror uh, segments of any game I've played, as well as just really great characters and writing and voice acting. The combat, I actually don't mind the combat. Um, I like the vampire powers a lot. The me melee combat is melee combat is fun for me. Um, I don't particularly like the ranged weapons or guns in it, but I just don't use them. And though there were definitely many bugs when it was released, it's gotten patched by fans a number of times over, so it's a fairly seamless experience. Even when I first played it, before I even knew about any patches, I didn't find the bugs all that bad. I mean, there was little things that you could definitely play through, but for the most part, um, I just love this game, and I think it's great for role-playing, so obviously this is another S tier. All right, we're down to the final three. We've got Wasteland 2 and Wasteland 3. Wasteland was actually, the original was the precursor to the Fallout games, and I've never played that one. But Wasteland 2 came out sometime in the 2010s, and you play these desert rangers trying to sort of uh, bring order to the land uh, in the apocalypse. And I liked Wasteland 2 quite a bit. There's a lot of little Easter eggs and funny little 80s references to find, like Teddy Ruxpin dolls and things like that. I generally liked the combat and the characters and the story. It wasn't one of my favorite CRPGs, but it was a good time. So I'm going to put Wasteland 2 in B. No, I'm going to put it in C, actually. Again, Wasteland 3 came out and it was just so much better and sort of uh, highlighted the flaws in, in Wasteland 2. So Wasteland 3 came out just a few years ago and you can play it on PC or console. It takes that same sort of setting, but just makes everything bigger and better. The characters are much more interesting, the places that you go, there's like a really sort of dark sense of humor to everything. It's fairly similar to the Fallout games, really, but I really like the role-playing and the different sort of abilities, weapons, and everything that you can use, and the different ways that you can approach every situation. And yeah, there's just a lot of humor in this game, and like a lot of really good like style and music choices and things like that. So I'm gonna put this one in B. And last but not least, this might actually be the first CRPG that I ever played. It's Wizardry 5. Heart of the Maelstrom, which is one when I was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 years old, sort of at the end of elementary school. I used to go over to my friend Leslie's house and we used to just like sit side by side at the computer playing through wizardry. And this is, again, hard to get into by this point. I think this came out in 1988, but I played it much later, like 1993, 94 probably. And, like, the maps are just wireframe walls, just like, it's very hard to navigate things, although the pixel art of the actual, like, enemies and characters you encounter in the, in the dungeons are interesting. You make your characters, and it's basically just text. You're just picking their class and sort of rolling their stats. They don't really have any actual character to them. You have to bring that to the game yourself. So it's a... It's a good game, the combat is interesting, it's like, 
you know, it's a very early role-playing game. So it's basically taking what you would do in a tabletop game and just trying to put a graphical interface on it, which looking back isn't all that impressive, but it was definitely interesting then. But the biggest problem with Wizardry 5 is that the dungeon is basically a maze. Like, there's no map, you had to draw your own map, and mazes generally just kind of suck. So while it had interesting parts to it, I find it very difficult to go back and play now. I actually tried it, but it's still, you know, that whole series was very important and influential on later games and those dungeon crawlers. It was just very, very punishing, and it cost so much money to bring a character back from death or from being uh, highly wounded. So I'm going to put Wizardry 5. I'm going to put it in C. So there we go. There is a look at the final rankings for all 39 CRPGs that I've played. It's possible I've missed some things because I just didn't have them categorized properly or I've forgotten about them. But I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. Four S ranks I think is a, a good number. The Bs are still very, very strong games. So this is a, a category where a lot of the games are just really, really good. All right, that is it for my CRPG rankings. Leave me a comment, let me know what your personal S tier CRPGs are, if there's any games that aren't on this list that you want to recommend um, me to play at some point in the future. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. If you want to see more, check out my last ranking video where I ranked all of the NES games I reviewed on the channel. Or check out something else. I have a Patreon if you want to support my videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.